You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R.com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors, All right, everybody. That music means that it is Education Wednesday. Time once again for a little bit of the old options boot camp, what the cool kids call OBC. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the T-H-E, optionsinsider.com, as well as from the network upon which all of you folks and your moms and your grandmas and your brothers and your sisters are all binging these days. Hey, the more the merrier. If you like the show, tell a friend. <laughs> Even though a lot of your friends are already listening, it seems like. But we love them all. We welcome you all out there. Keep driving our bandwidth bills up. There's more where that came from. We'll reach deep into our back pocket to buy you folks some more bandwidth to mainline on. Remember, if you like what you hear, don't just tell a friend, but tell people online. A rating, a review, a comment, all that stuff does help to conspire to drive up our bandwidth bills. So if you want to stick your nose in the eye of the black-hatted one, that's a good way to do it as well. <laughs> leave a rating, leave a comment, whatever you can. Conspire to drive up the bandwidth bills. All that at the end of the day does help. Just like our five-star reviewer this week, Midas78. I guess he's got the got the golden touch. Maybe he likes just uh, the Midas mufflers. I don't know. Either way, <laughs> thanks for writing in, Midas. He says, heard about this show on Reddit. Oh, quite a few folks have said that. Uh, lots of good stuff here. I'm learning a lot. Well, glad to see you. However you folks come in, whether it's from the growing number of you who like to listen on the newly public Reddit, did you get a piece of the Reddit IPO action? Didn't look that good at first, then uh, looking a little better now. Uh, hit us up, let us know. We're happy uh, to set you folks straight. We know sometimes on some of these boards and other places, there's a lot of misinformation floating around. A lot of people who've been trading options for two months and now profess to be gurus. <laughs> a lot of self-taught masters of options out there dan and i learned the ropes the hard way we had it beaten into us quite literally sometimes on the floor of the cboe as market makers so that still to me is the best way to learn how to trade options so if you're going to learn options trading and you can't really do that route anymore then you might as well learn from people who have done it and that means i am referring to him i might as well welcome on my cohort the black hatted one himself Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring, what the cool kids call mm to him. Mr. P, welcome back to the show. And would you concur that still to this day, the best way to learn about options is from someone who went the market maker route, sir? Yeah, I mean, you know, and I, I mean, I guess in some ways we're biased, but I mean, the fact of the matter is when you when you trade as a market maker, you're taking the other side of thousands and thousands of trades. Like you end up making every single type of trade there is. And in a lot of ways, you're argu arguably on the wrong side of it because the person who spent all the time researching and, and came up with a smart trade idea to buy this spread, well, you're the one who's selling it to them. So you have to, you're not only making every single possible type of trade out there that there is a thousand times, but you're learning how to manage them, you know, against the grain too. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, 
it's a great breeding ground for for learning options for sure. Yeah, that's my point. Not to beat our chest and say we're so cool because we used to be market makers, even though we are pretty cool. If I do say so myself, but it, it's exactly that reason. You're right. We had literally thousands of trades foisted upon us on a daily basis that we did not want and uh, had to somehow make sense of. I mean, my favorite examples of those were when I was trading out in the SPX and the phone would ring and someone would call up with some obtuse Dan one by three by two and a half by five spread on the calendars and diagonals and swaps that they had spent a week pricing up and analyzing right and and figuring out the exact way they wanted to trade it then you have three seconds you know to do the exact same analysis and then you make your market then you're stuck with this thing (laughs) and you have to figure out some way to make money off of it so uh, there is no better way at the end of the day to learn risk management which is the most important thing when you're trading options and having all these trades just foisted upon you. I compare it to immersion training for a language, Dan. You want to go learn Italian, you just move to Italy. You sink or you swim. Uh, You have to learn how to ask to go to the bathroom, right? That's how you do it. So uh, same thing with uh, market making. We all learned how to go to the bathroom very quickly in the world of market making to continue that very tortured analogy, sir. Uh, So yes, it's a good way to learn how to trade options. Learn from folks who've been down that road a little bit. Let's go down that road a little bit right now. A little bit of the old... Options drills. Well, in boots, time for our favorite pastime, option drills. We're going to take the strategies learned during the show and teach you how they can be employed to achieve a specific objective. Do you hear me? Yes, sir! All right, everybody, let's get to a little bit of the old options drills. And uh, Dan, this next one's interesting, kind of a timely one. I'm going to have to do a little bit of talking to set it up, I think. So I might have a sip of a beverage and lubricate my throat before I get going. While I'm doing that, Dan, why don't you tell us your thoughts right now? Uh, We are kind of languishing in this fairly low, I would say, all things VIX and volatility environment. Obviously, if you know vol... Uh, We're getting back down to some levels that we've been to in the past, and you could argue where we were over the last few years in the 20s to 30s was the aberration. That was the the upside. Uh, But still, we're hanging out shy of a 13 handle. Got a 12 handle back again in VIX right now. So a lot of people are wringing their hands and saying vol is low, and maybe they're a little bit confused by this because they look at some other things going on in the market, and they think, man, there's there's some risk out there. There's some concern about retracement about downside and maybe they're a little bit confused as to why vol is this low so dan while i prepare for this epic treatise on on this great vol debate that's going on right now on vol twit and in the media uh, what are your thoughts what do you think is keeping us in this fairly low vol regime right now sir well i mean first of all if you look at a volatility chart of a lot of stuff the implied volatility is still hanging out above historical. So, I mean, it's kind of deservedly here. Uh, I mean, if you're looking at this as a low level, uh, w- which it is, um, it it hasn't really been this low for a good five, six years. Last time I looked at it, I think, um, has been lower, but it was a while ago and it and it's few and far between where we have regimes where it's lower than this so i mean it's 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 kind of well deserved and when markets climb up and up and up and up over periods of time like 5 months like it's been they tend to do so with lower volatility and people put on those uh, volatility complacent strategies like covered calls and credit spreads and such um to take advantage of you know, I guess the volatility that's overpriced. I mean, you would think that that would push the volatility lower, but I guess it doesn't. Well, let's get out there and see what's cooking right now. Dan, a lot of this debate seems to be centered around the growth in AUM or indeed assets under management of a lot of these quote unquote derivatives income funds. When I say derivatives income funds, uh, that's really predominantly covered call funds. Not a lot of funds out there blasting away at puts. There are a few. But uh, the predominant nature of these funds are covered call funds out there. And for a long time, I've met with the folks at Morningstar many times trying to 
boost up their analysis of options related funds. Uh, they kind of just lumped them all in what I used to term this the options ghetto. Anything that used an option, whether it was income, protection, it was all under the same rubric of options oriented funds. And for obvious reasons, that doesn't really work. I tried to convince them to change that so with not much success. They didn't really seem to get the, the value of this space. I think they're starting to understand it a little bit more now, Dan. Uh, because a lot of people pointing out the journal and others recently that uh, assets in these quote unquote derivative income funds really exploding over the last few years. At the end of February, according to Morningstar, 80 billion in AUM out there. It may not sound like a lot compared to your traditional just S&P 500 funds, but that's up from 7 billion at the end of 2020. The SEC made a few tweaks back at the end of 2020 that made it easier for ETFs to now buy and sell options. As a result, this class has kind of exploded. Uh, the largest one right now, the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF, has almost $33 billion in assets alone, so it's over a third of the entire category, just that one fund out there. Dan, have you been, uh, have you been aware of this rise in effectively covered call funds over the last few years, sir? Um, no, honestly, um no, I, I guess I, I'm not. I mean, I, I know that they've I know that the strategy has gotten a lot more popular, um, but I guess not really that there's been that kind of a flow into it. No. Yeah, apparently everyone and their mother is slinging some covered calls, Dan. Now people are pointing the finger at that and saying that is the reason this explosion of growth in AUM and these derivatives income funds is the reason that vol is so muted right now. A lot of people uh, saying that. So this kind of debate in the vol space and in financial media kicked off a few weeks ago, it seems like. When SIBO came out with a report, uh, they have Mandy Zhu over there. She's be a credit Swiss. She's been on our vol show a few times. A good vol and kind of macro strategist out there. She wrote a report titled, Our Option Income Fund Suppressing Volatility. She points out the same things. I was just mentioning the growth of AUM and these funds and everything else like that. But she points out a few interesting data points that I would have expected to see if they were the culprit as well, which is first off, if these vol selling, these covered call strategies were to blame, one would expect uh, the call wing, the call, the bit of the call skew in these to be just annihilated because everyone in the mother is selling covered calls. And the truth is actually the opposite. Some of her research just from a few weeks ago shows that the bid in these calls is similar to what we saw back in the early days of 2021. So it's meme stock Palooza land again in a lot of these single names. And it's getting pretty juicy in the indexes as well, which is not exactly the setup that you would expect out there. Also, you expect the, you know, the volatility risk premium, the amount of juice you get selling implied volatility versus the actual realized would shrink. And actually, it's the opposite. That risk premium has increased. <laughs> quite a bit out there as we're seeing yeah recently implied vol not exactly pricing in all the moves we're seeing out there in the marketplace so selling vol hasn't exactly been the uh, the juiciest of strategies so SIBO comes out and says no a few weeks ago and then uh, a lot of people coming out the other way now including the folks over at QVR advisors they've been on our vol show a few times as well this is like Scott Maydell doing their research he's been on our vol view show in the past uh, they write saying have option selling strategies and funds suppressed implied volatility? The answer to this question is unequivocally yes. <laughs> they, don't, they don't beat the bush at all. They come out and say, you know what? This is the culprit. This is what's keeping vol depressed. They quote a couple of data points, including some charts from the SIBO. So kind of trying to hoist SIBO on their own petard, I suppose, by using their own chart out there. They say end users, by the way, of option selling funds aren't intentionally contributing to this suppression but they are ending up doing it nonetheless at the end of the day as well. And the growth of AUM and these funds, they say, are the cause. And these strategies are contributing to a large structural dislocation involved, have been doing so increasingly in mass since the post-great financial crisis. So they say this goes all the way back to the end of GFC. And now, not to be one to miss out on a trend, Dan, uh, the Wall Street Journal jumping into the fray this week as well, uh, writing an article entitled, The Short Vol Trade is Back. Why some investors think it's driving tranquility in the markets. Uh, they, again, point out all these same data points I just brought out. The growth in AUM over these funds over the last four years. And some of the tweaks that have allowed them to grow. And also saying these funds are now to blame for tamping down on volatility. And they quote a lot of people in the article saying effectively that 
uh, Eric Metz, who's been on our network in the past as well. He's over at Spider Rock now. He said, I don't think it's a coincidence. I do think it's a function of demographics. So that's kind of interesting. They also kind of try to tie it in, Dan. This is where I think they stretch a little bit. They try to tie in this vol selling, which again, all these funds are mostly covered call funds, into the next Volmageddon. This is a reprise of what we saw back in 2018, which was, of course, XIV, which was an inverse VIX fund, which is a completely different beast than a covered call fund. But they try to lump them all into the category of selling vol at the end of the day. And can this lead to a Volmageddon 2.0 as a result? Because everyone's now a short vol out there. I think saner heads are probably prevailing on that one. But a lot of things to debate here, Dan, that are kind of interesting. First off, we'll get to the Volmageddon stuff in a second. I have to charitably conclude that hopefully some editors foisted that on the reporters, and that wasn't their supposition to begin with out there. But I'll have to go look and see who wrote that article for the journal. But that said, Dan, before we get there, where do you fall on this great vol debate right now? Assets under management exploding in covered call funds. Is that what's keeping us at this extremely, at least for recent history, low level of Vixer? Yeah, I mean, it's something that can. The interesting thing about it is... The the whole point of short volatility is – well, I mean the point of it is you do it when it's overpriced and, and you collect theta. But what comes along with that is negative gamma, right? And so when the going's good, the going's great. But what the problem ends up being is that like three sigma move – when something kind of crazy happens because then stuff really can get exacerbated fast. Um, you know, and it's, it's kind of the same old thing, um, with, with this conversation where it's like, Hey, everything's going great. Everything's fine. Yeah. There's no problem. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. And then, um, when something blows up, which it happens every now and then it's definitely one of those black swan type events, but as we all know, they call them black swan events because they happen more than they're mathematically supposed to. When they happen, then everybody in hindsight says, oh, yeah, I mean, of course, that's what happened. Like, why? Why did that exist? And right now, people are benefiting from it. It's it's easy money. It's shooting fish in a barrel. Um, it works until it doesn't work. Yeah, you know, I, th I think the data points that the SIBO points out are kind of interesting. First off, the fact that you think it was all covered calls doing this, Dan. You think the call wing would be crushed, right? And that is not the case. Single names, equity indexes, the call wing is juicier than it has been in quite some time since effectively back in 2021. You got to go all the way back that far. Uh, so people are obviously buying upside. They're not just selling it. So that's the first data point. I think the point about the volatility risk premium is also interesting. So those are the two data points I look at. And also the fact that we are kind of continually moving north in the markets out there. Some days it's aggressively north, but still, at the end of the day, all those factors should probably conspire to keep vol at some fairly low levels. Now, that doesn't mean everything is tranquil. You look at some of the skew out there, uh, What that's interesting, what's going on in some of these products out there, what's going on in index puts and everything else like that. Uh, that certainly is intriguing. Uh, the other part of this article, Dan, that I, I took issue with was this. They say these funds are a different take on the short vol trade that blew up in spectacular fashion six years ago, a February 2018 surge in stock market turbulence led to the collapse of two volatility exchange traded products in an episode that became known as Volmageddon, causing huge losses for many individual investors. The blow up rippled through the broader market and fueled further sell. I think it's a stretch, Dan, to link a JP Morgan covered call fund so you're selling, what, I'll have to look at their prospectus, 5%, maybe 10% out of the money calls <laughs> in broad indexes for the most part. Linking that to an inverse VIX product like XIV, which anyone who was sane knew that product had, they even, they even said it in their prospectus. There could be an, an unwind event, right, where they knew VIX has no theoretical limit to the upside, and they were shorted. <laughs> so they could very easily be, quote-unquote, unwound, which was driven to zero. And that's effectively what happened with that product. I don't think selling covered calls in a large index and managing an inverse vol book are exactly the same thing. Do you, Dan? Yeah, no. Uh, now, no. No. Um, 
but I'm not going to play devil's advocate because – Oh, play not, it. Let's do it. Let's have fun. Let's play. Yeah. I mean it's it's not the same thing, <clears throat> but when we're looking at some of these short volatility funds, what we have to consider is what's on the other side of that trade. Um, and when when the shares – are, are traded there. Like there's arbitrageurs on the other side of that that are laying off the risk. And what they're doing ultimately is some sort of option selling activity in the market and acquiring negative gamma. And I guess this is kind of where I was going with this in what I said leading up to this. I mean, I guess I, maybe I got a little bit ahead of our conversation here. So yeah, I mean, it, it's clearly a different thing than the Balmageddon stuff, like, you know, doomsday scenario that happened. But there is a little bit of a commonality in that it is introducing a lot more big money negative gamma. And, and when that stuff happens, like you end up having, you well, know, I mean, basically what people nowadays call a, a gamma squeeze can happen and and it, and it can just exacerbate stuff. Of course, when you talk about the gamma squeezes famously back in, in 2021, that was where people were buying a lot of upside, right? So the market makers, like we were talking about earlier, were taking the other side of that. So they were short infinite upside. So they kept blowing through strikes that they were short to the upside. They mm -hmm. were short gamma. So that kind of led fuel to the fire. You know, the, the hypothesis of this article is the other way, that they're loading up. They're choking on upside, right? They're long gamma for days. <laughs> so yeah. in that yeah. scenario, I, I think the, the chances of a squeeze uh, – from a gamma perspective on the market maker side, you don't really exist, at least to that same extent. So I think it's kind of a little bit hyperbolic. I get it. You have to sell papers at the end of the day. You got to drive clicks uh, mm -hmm. on the websites. So I understand throwing a little bit of Almageddon in there. It is fun to just say Almageddon. I get it. <laughs> but I, I, don't think, I don't think the prospect of a lot of funds, 80 billion under AUM selling covered calls on a fairly routine basis is the same thing as a product that has to be inverse VIX all the time and when VIX goes to 80, guess what? That product goes to zero. It's, I think for the most part, there's obviously another culprit out there I think that's keeping vol suppressed. They don't even talk about zero day in this article. I don't think we still really fully understand the intersection of all this flow, 50% of SPX flow and all these other indexes flowing into options that are listed and expire in the same day. That's obviously going to have an impact on how the rest of the options trade and performs. I don't think we fully understand even that yet. There's a lot of other shoes to potentially drop. I'd be curious for you folks out there. In fact, this might be a good question of the week for next week. Producers take note about, uh, do you believe what the Wall Street Journal is selling out there? Is it the growth of assets and all these derivatives income, a.k.a. covered call funds that are to blame out there, listeners, for all this madness in the vol space right now? Hit us up. Let us know as we keep on rolling. we got time for a little bit of the old Mail call. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, Dan, the folks have been waiting with bated breath for you to regale them with their hotly anticipated market taker question of the week. What you got for us? Uh, well, yeah, I'll tell you what. Um, here's what I want to do this week. Instead of me passing along a question of the week, I want to give our listeners an opportunity to ask me a question or to ask me several questions. And so here's what we're going to do. Um, in relation to our summit that we're having in June in Sonoma, uh, we are going to have this Saturday what we call an Ask Me Anything, an AMA, and that's going to be on Saturday morning for people to ask me questions about what our summit is all about. 
and maybe whether they should attend, whether it's for them, uh, where it is, what we're going to cover, anything that you need to know in order to make that decision. And I would love for you to come. Uh, so here's what you do. Uh, what you can do is make your way in over to markettaker.com. Just click join free and we are going to send you an email on it tomorrow, your own very special invitation, and uh, we'll get you set up. Maybe you too, listeners, can get the sweet VIP invite that I got. You know, all expenses paid out to Napa, you know, a tour on the wine train, uh, a suite at the Ritz. Stan, you really went all out for me. I, I'm very appreciative of that. That's very nice of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll be there just, um, yeah. Um, if, if they don't know about what your reservation is at the Ritz, just um, just be persistent. I'll just tell them to uh, put on the MTM tab, you know, massages every day, surf yeah. and turf meals every evening. I mean, you really went all out. You know, I, I appreciate the recognition of what I've brought to your life, sir. I, that's very <laughs> nice of you. <laughs> Excellent. I was actually just talking with someone just uh, the other day about uh, Napa Valley Vineyards, and now it's got me wanting to go back. I haven't been to Napa in quite some time. I think the OCC uh, should take your lead, sir, and do the next OIC conference out in Napa. That would be fun. Yeah, man. Uh, it's, I'll tell you what. It's it's a nice part of the country. I mean, even if you're not into wine or, you know, you don't like fancy foods or anything like that, it's a, it's a just a beautiful part of the country. Man. It is a beautiful it's, part of the country. It's like Tuscany in America. And yeah, and I think a lot of people would go to that conference if, if it was in Napa versus random golf resort in Florida or wherever they want to hold it out there. But I digress, Mr. Dan. We have to keep rolling with our double header. If you're listening live in the pro hangout, we'll be back instantaneously with episode two in your ear holes. If you're on the on demand side, that will be coming at you next week. If you want to speed up that process, also get access to our awesome pro Q&As. Just did one yesterday with our old buddy, The Last Emperor. The man who runs the Active Trader Strategy Desk over there at Fidelity. So he's fielding all your questions all day long on the options side, tackling a bunch of them yesterday in our pro Q&A sessions. If you also want options oddities, you want my chat with the folks over there at SIBO about their thoughts about all this stuff that I did down at the FAA conference recently. The panel I did back in STAC uh, with Henry and a bunch of other people all up there exclusively for you folks as well. Of course, as 300 plus other episodes waiting for you the second you hit that button. Plus, we're coming up to the end of March, listeners. It's hard to believe I have to give away another pro trading crate in a couple of days. You folks are cleaning me up. I'm just kidding. We have a lot of stuff to give you folks. We're happy to do it. But uh, yeah, if you want to get your name in the hat for the March pro trading crate, only one place to go. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro. Once you're there, you get all that cool stuff. And you can also join us live for this show, everything else we do. You can heckle Dan live, which is, that's, I got to admit it, that's worth the price of admission right there. Just send Dan some online hate, right, Mr. Dan? Just some true vitriol. Or you can, or you can thank him for setting me up with that sweet VIP tour of Napa that he did, which was very kind of you, sir. And if folks want their own VIP tour of Napa, where should they go? What should they do? Oh, yes. Hey, oh, you know what? Actually, uh, my guy, Bobby Valentine, he's our um, our he's the man behind the scenes here. He just set up a special link for your folks. Uh, MarketTaker.com dot com slash AMA. Uh, and there you can go and sign up for the ask me anything. Uh, so then you're already in the in the queue, as they say, across the pond. In the queue, get in the queue over there at markettaker.com. Don't forget the second T. And if you're listening to live, you're already in the queue because we'll be back instantaneously. Otherwise, we'll see you back here next week. Same bat time, same bat channel for your next episode of Options Bootcamp. Stay safe out there, everybody. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options 